thanks to all of you, my friends in the Constitution Party who made all this possible and who have made this into such a uh, professional group. It's good to see my old friend Jim Eddings again back at another meeting. We've been together for many, many years. Of course, my thanks to the uh, young people who sing tonight. But a special thanks to my wife, Joan. I always thank her every time I speak because uh, she deserves it. Uh, you have no idea what she does and what she goes through. Uh, if it weren't for her, I certainly wouldn't be here. Uh, but um, there are states out there that we are struggling to get ballot access in who had given up and quit just wouldn't do anything. But Joan pushes, pulls, shames, uh, <laughs> and, and into working, and then she puts together a plan to show them how it can be done. And then we go there, uh, and we, we help them start and get it done. I haven't walked my district. <laughs> I have certainly driven. Uh, I have driven. Uh, and Next week, uh, I'm going to start flying. Next week, we go to, well, Denver and uh, on the 4th of July, we're in uh, Laramie, Wyoming at some type of cowboy festival. And then uh, we, we've got some media around uh, the state of Wyoming. And then we come back home for a while. But the point is, I'm going to tell you some things tonight about why I'm doing this and what the whole point of it all is. And uh, when I get through with it, uh, you're going to, to be like Joan. You're going to understand why it's necessary for you not to just vote for me, but to work night and day like she does. Uh, Joan doesn't, she's not like a normal person. She doesn't, uh, she doesn't eat or sleep. Uh, she just works. You know, I'll be in bed. I'm like a fighter, you know. He, he goes out, he fights, he sleeps, he gets up, he fights some more. But Joan never stops. She's all hours of the night. I mean, I'm not kidding. I, I'll wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and I'll hear something <laughs> across upstairs, you know. I'll say she's still up. Anyway, uh, I want to talk to you some tonight about some things that uh, explain kind of why I'm doing this, and what my basis is, what, what my views, my principles are, and what I'm really trying to do. You know, the people who founded this country had a certain set of principles. They went by a set of beliefs, and they put that into, into effect. And we could call those beliefs, and the way they wrote it, in the Constitution, their original intent. That's what they meant. That was their intent when they wrote that document and the one that preceded it, the Declaration. Um, they had a certain set of principles. The first among those is that rights come from God, not from government. Right. They call these rights inalienable. That just means that the government doesn't give them to us and government can't legitimately take them away from us. Um, they said that uh, the purpose of government and the reason for this Constitution was to secure those God-given rights. Yeah. That's the reason that we have government. It's the reason yeah. it exists, they said. That's what they believed. They believed this so strongly that they put right into the Constitution the words, the oath that a, a person who is elected president must take upon his inauguration. He must pledge or affirm before God and the American people that he will protect, preserve, and defend the Constitution. He doesn't take an oath to us. He doesn't say he'll protect us and defend us, although, I mean, that's obviously one of his duties. He doesn't say that he'll defend the nation. He says he will protect, preserve, and defend the Constitution. As you know, not many of them pay much attention to uh, I doubt if they give a lot of thought to it at all. I doubt if they wake up tonight and say, you know, I take an oath to do this, uh, and I'm not fulfilling it. I doubt that. 
Um, well, they wanted a government that um, that was too weak to usurp the rights of the people. Uh, they wanted a government that uh, had diffused powers. Uh, by that I mean it uh, it had they formed a government with three distinct branches. Those three distinct branches were co-equal, co-equal, but they gave one branch the right to make law, no other, just one. In Article One, Section One, all legislative authority uh, is vested in Congress. Read the Constitution as many times as you want, and you will see no place where any other organization is given the right to make law. Uh, it calls itself the supreme law of the land, along with the laws made pursuant to it, along with treaties made in, uh, in pursuit of it. Well, um, they wanted limited government, as I said. They wanted uh, a government that respected the sovereignty of the states who formed it. The states came together. They were sovereign. Uh, and they formed a compact, and they agreed to do certain things. They agreed to surrender part of their sovereignty to this general government. The states did. Uh, they surrendered 17 powers that they uh, originally held by themselves. They surrendered that to the general government, or the federal government, as we've come to call it. Those 17 powers are set out in uh, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. That tells Congress and the President and the judiciary, this is all you have, nothing more. The states kept everything else for themselves. Uh, the Tenth Amendment says that all other powers reserved to the states or to the people, so that is all that they had, those 17 powers. Well, this party, this Constitution party that most of you are members of, uh, was founded. It also had an original intent when it was founded. I know this because I was there. Joan was too. Joan, uh, wasn't involved in the actual uh, uh, development of the party to the extent that I was, but she was always there. She's been with me every step of the way for 38 years. I've dragged her into many different things that she went into kicking and screaming, and then she eventually took them over and ran them. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, she and I, I was involved in the original uh, uh, formation of the party, the original drafting of the, of the uh, platform, along with a couple of other gentlemen smarter than I am. Those are, there are four other men, actually. They're all dead now. But uh, we had an original intent as well. We talked about these things. And that original intent was that the original intent of the people who wrote the Constitution was still valid and it could be defended to the nation in election. That was in 1992. I still hold that view today, that's why I'm here. Uh, I believe that's still the case today. I believe it can still be defended. Uh, people look at the Constitution and its words when you talk about only 17 powers and they think, well, how, how quaint is that, you know? I mean, uh, that's very interesting, those words, but that is what I believe today. The, I, would, I would submit to you also that the Constitution Party is the only party who believes those words. It's the only one. There are no others. Right. And therefore, I am the only candidate who believes that. There are no other candidates. Uh, it would be fair to say that I'm the only conservative candidate in this race. <laughs> but uh, I usually reject those labels when somebody wants to ask me, well, are you, are you this or that, a conservative? But in this case, I accept it. You can call me that. I'm the only one in the race. I prefer to be called a preservationist because I seek to preserve something. I seek to preserve uh, Western civilization and all the benefits that it's brought to America and to other people who live in the West and enjoy its benefits. Benefits going back 800 years to the Magna Carta. It's all gone now, or at least under severe attack, I seek to restore that. The original intent, the rule of law, the Constitution says it's the supreme law of land, but the rule of law simply means 
you know, you've heard the expression, we're a nation of laws and not of men. That's not true anymore, is it? Uh, the rule of law just means that uh, it applies equally to everybody. From the President of the United States to the homeless veteran that sleeps in your city park, no one is above it and no one is beneath it. We know for a fact that the rule of law is dead. It doesn't apply anymore. We know that there are two laws now, two sets of laws, one for them and one for little people like us. If the rule of law weren't dead, Mrs. Clinton would have been indicted. The evidence of her criminality is overwhelming. Uh, so she's not indicted, therefore the rule of law is dead. Perhaps it, I'm wrong, though. There's still time. I mean, it could still happen. We'll see what Loretta Lynch does with that uh, problem that she faces. But more and more, the Russians, this is my, my talk about Mrs. Clinton, in case you hadn't noticed it, more and more, Evidence comes out, the Russians now say they hold many, many emails that they intercepted from her private server, emails that are very embarrassing that they would release if she's elected. WikiLeaks' uh, Julian Assange had released 30,000 emails that he stole from her uh, in some fashion. All these things are embarrassing, I suspect, I don't know this for a fact, I'm just speculating, but I suspect the president may be on the other end, the receiving end of some of those emails. We'll see. But that is um, that is something that's happened. That is the end of the rule of law. Well, we've talked we've talked about the original intent of the founders, the original intent of the Constitution as a foundation for government. Well, unfortunately, we have a new government today. They don't share those views. They they have. They do not share those principles. They have principles, just not like yours. Uh, in fact, they're not even what you think they are. The government that actually runs the United States now uh, is made up of some really interesting and different people. They have principles, like I said. Uh, you know, they're various international corporations, bureaucrats, uh, non-governmental organizations, but primarily the super billionaires that roam around the world and have their meetings and so forth. Um, and they have principles. I'm going to give you five principles that they share, that they uh, you know, are inflicting on us as we speak. The first one is world currency. That's one of their first principles, world currency or world money. This is here and now in the form of the International Monetary Fund Special Drawing Rights. That's not money for us, us little people. They have, I'll get to that in a minute. But it's money that is used in commerce between nations, in the oil markets and other commerce. It's the way they deal with the debt uh, because uh, the uh, special drawing rights are available to people who control the world's currencies. Number two, world taxation global taxation. Taxation of every working human being on earth is a bonus. Why? Because global problems. There are global problems now. And it's going to require a contribution, a fair share from every person on earth who works. Uh, what global problem would, would require something like that? Well, climate change, of course. Uh, it is the biggest problem that we face in, the, in world history, the president has told us. Bigger than World War II, bigger than World War I. Uh, it's the biggest problem humanity has faced in world history, and we're going to need global taxation if we're going to, to deal with it. Um, number three. Number three. Two. World cashless society. A world without cash. That's a bonus right now. Uh, some of you might not have used cash in a while. Uh, it's, you know, panic now when you leave on a trip and you don't have any money because you've got your car, you know. Uh, you might need to buy a cup of coffee or something, but a lot of people even put that on the car. But in other countries, in, in the Scandinavian countries, uh, Sweden, uh, Norway, and even across Northern Europe, Denmark, the Netherlands, they are virtually cashless now. We're told by the banking establishment that 60% of all money is held outside the banking establishment. They 
they want that the stock. They want that money uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, everything will have a fee. Everything will go through the banking system. Every penny you earn, every penny you spend will be digital inside the banking system. Your taxes will be prepared by someone else, probably someone in government, who then will simply debit your account. And uh, uh, every, uh, every so often, uh, certain taxation might be placed on your account, bail-ins they're called. Uh, but the, most, the important thing is, as long as you stay quietly on the plantation, you'll be fine. But if you go off the reservation, your card might be canceled. How much easier will that be when everything is microchipped? See, cards get lost and they get stolen. Microchips are the wave of the future. It's so much easier. You don't have to carry anything around with you. It's just right there somewhere in your body, no bigger than a grain of rice. Fourth, world government, obviously. You've got to have a world government to run a system like this. Uh, we have a world government now, kind of. Uh, the G20 nations operates as a de facto world government. It's the board of directors for the world, telling the world, directing the world. And by the way, the world cashless money system is for us. It's for us little people. Uh, it's not like the special drawing rights. It's to, to make sure that all of us stay in our proper places. All of your money, imagine it. All of your money, I mean everything in your life, everything you work for, the fruits of your labor, everything you ever will have, your children will have, everything that generations unborn will have will be right there in their control, all tied in together with a system of, uh, of global control through a, uh, an operations center. I used to say out in the Utah desert because that's what I read. But Joan and I actually went out there and saw it. It's actually not a desert. Uh, it's, it's only a few miles south of, uh, of Salt Lake City. And you can only get within about a mile of it. Then they have security, you can't get any closer. But it's just a gi gigantic center out in Utah. It costs two to four billion dollars. And it allows the National Security Agency to listen to every telephone call on Earth, to, to read and monitor every email on Earth, every human being on Earth. It sounds fantastic, and it is. It sounds like science fiction. It's science, but it's not fiction. It's actually there. It's happening now. Facial recognition software watches you in every city in America and tracks you around the planet. Big brother. Might not be watching you, but he could be if he wanted to be. Uh, just, just get a little lucky. Just go off the plantation, and you'll see what will happen. You will be targeted. Fifth, this is their last printing. Well, actually, it's not. It's the last one I'm going to give you. Um, the government school system has our kids eight hours a day, five days a week, for 16 years, sometimes longer. That's a long time, though. That's a lot of propaganda. It's a lot of brainwashing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it doesn't have them, then they're subject to Hollywood type of entertainment. Everything that exists on Earth can be sent to them through their cell phones, all the information. Yeah. You don't have to know anything. Hold up my cell phones. I'm just supposed to be taking pictures. Um, that little machine right there has more computing power than NASA had for all the Apollo moon missions combined. That's, that's amazing, isn't it? Uh, I'm told that within three years, just three years from now, that little machine will be able to translate conversations into hundreds of different dialects between anybody on Earth. In other words, when we call our mission in Romania, we won't have to worry about them not being able to speak English and us not speaking Romanian. That little machine will simply translate the conversation for us and put it in the voice in each of our languages right then. That's coming very soon. Technology is really amazing. We're in a race with government. Government is trying to destroy the world before technology can, can change it. But it's bringing in new things, new sources of life. I, uh, as you know, I, I'm very much into pro-life, into the pro-life movement. I think. 
life is important. I'll defend it till the day I die. Uh, but there are people who don't feel that way. They, uh, they don't see life the same way we do. I see life as a gift from God. Amen. The Bible tells us that life of God is a gift of life. Uh, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, so, uh, and so forth. Uh, but uh, other people see it differently. I'll tell you something right now. This is proof. What the human mind can conceive of, it can do. What it can do, it will do. Uh, right now, as we speak, there are scientists out there all around the world, not just in this country, but all over the world. We're just the most innovative and the most effective. There are people who are developing new sources of life, new types of life. They're messing with God's yes. eternal plan. They are combining the DNA and, uh, and so forth of humans and plants and making clones of, of, of cross species, humans and animals, but most importantly, humans and machines. We're told by, uh, by that gentleman who runs uh, Tesla, all of a sudden his name escapes me, but uh, he said that uh, very soon our brains would be interfaced with machines and uh, there's nothing we can do about it. It's a good thing, look at it as a good thing because imagine being able to download an entire library into your brain and know everything about everything except what's really important. Yeah. Uh, the knowledge that you must have, you will not have. Um, but this is coming, uh, these people who do this, why do they do it? Because uh, they want to live forever, the thought of death uh, the thought of death mm -hmm. pervades man. He's so terrified of all these people, these super billionaires, these, these techno wizards. They're out there trying to find immortality, and they think they found it. Mm -hmm. uh, I was reading the other day, I, I follow all this stuff. I was reading that, um, that if we can just live 10 to 20 more years, if we can just hang on 10 to 20 more years, we'll be able to live two, three, four, maybe 500 years. The aging process will be conquered. Aging is, is not nece necessary, you know, as you get older, all you guys I know uh, have, have heard this. That's just a natural part of aging, you're told. But you say, but that, I don't want that. I don't want to give up that part of my life. I, I, I'm still, you know, I still want that to continue. Well, I'm sorry, that's just a natural part of aging. Well, uh, that won't happen anymore, these people tell us. We'll live. Uh, indefinite lives. You know, that same gentleman who runs uh, Tesla, Tesla Motors, that make those $130,000 electric cars. He said he wanted to die on Mars, just not on impact. Uh, <laughs> he, he, uh, he says that uh, soon all these billionaires, I refer to them as super billionaires because they've got billions and billions of dollars. They're out there exploring space soon uh, they will be able to travel around planets if, I don't know why anybody would want to I mean why would you want to spend years in a tiny little box hurtling through the blackness of space I don't get it but they do that's what they want to do now this is what we're we're looking at what our future is in the in in America if we don't do something in the Constitution party it's the only hope I mean, I, I don't mean to sound blasphemous. I know God's the only hope. I realize that. Uh, unlike the other candidates in this race, I actually am a Christian. Many of you might be too. Uh, not all of you probably, uh, but many of you are. I want to tell you something about some of the other candidates right now that's, that separate us. We talked about Mrs. Clinton. I mean, do I really have to talk about her? She, she says that, uh, that, uh, uh, Human persons, she says, unborn persons have no constitutional rights. That's what she said. Unborn persons have no. She used the word persons, obviously, a slip of tongue because the Supreme Court had said if these little creatures were persons, then Roe v. Wade would be unconstitutional, but they're not. So the other thing about her recently is that she, uh, she just, today, with the Brexit vote, has left what happened. Uh, she issued a list of 400 CEOs that endorse CEOs of various corporations. And just as the world is starting to reject that, to turn away from it, to say enough is enough, 
by the way, as we go through these candidates, I am not uh, depressed tonight for the first time in a long time. Uh, I don't necessarily, well, actually I do think the world is going to hell in a handbasket, because it is. But uh, I'm not depressed. I, I'm actually kind of giddy about it because of this vote in Great Britain. I, I just think it's one of the most wonderful things that's ever happened in my lifetime because this great nation rejected collectivization. They said, we want to be free. Uh, now, how many times has this one little country, this one little island, uh, saved Europe? I can tell you, I mean, I can name at least uh, one very recently. Uh, if it hadn't been for them, and 1,000 young men from that island, civilization in Europe would have been lost. Um, so I'm happy about that vote. I think it, uh, it bodes well for our future. I have to give it to, to Mr. Trump. He said, uh, the British have reclaimed their freedom. We should do the same thing. Uh, that, he thought about that. I have to agree with him. Now, let me tell you something else Mr. Trump said recently. He said so many things. He, uh, I mean, I agree with him about a lot of things. I agree with him in large part about immigration. Uh, but um, I don't agree with him about everything. See, it's all about him. He has no principle. By that I mean he, the Constitution doesn't exist for him. He doesn't even know what it is. He feels limited by nothing. Uh, it's just him. Just what, what do you think as a businessman would work? Uh, what, what should I do that would work? Uh, that's how businessmen think. You know, but we have a, a constitution that limits government. It tells us what we can do, what we can't do. For me, it would tell me what my powers are as president. It would tell me what my powers are not. But he has nothing like that. Anyway, I wanted to tell you something he said recently. He said uh, when, when he was being questioned about Christianity, some of you may have seen that interview with Cal Thomas, where, Tom, where Thomas asked him about uh, who Jesus was, and he couldn't answer. Uh, he gave some uh, answer, but not really an answer. You know, he just gave some nonsense about uh, an, an inspirational person or something like that. But the other day, he said that uh, he said, "I can save you a lot quick, quicker than some silly cross." Wow. I can oh. save you a lot quicker than some silly cross. Mm -hmm. You can't vote for that. No. Uh, if you're a Christian, you can't vote for it. Now, that only leaves uh, one. I'm not going to talk about Jill Stein. I could. You know, I, I, I'm very familiar with the Green Party, having worked with them for nine years on this lawsuit that we're in. But uh, I know many of their members, Jill Stein, Ivy League lawyer like Mrs. Clinton and so forth, but we know what she stands for. Uh, Gary Johnson, our Libertarian Friends candidate. He, uh, he's pro-abortion, he's pro-open borders, pro-immigration, but the other day he said that he thinks that uh, Jews should be forced to bake birthday cakes for Nazis. Hell. That's what he said. Damn. Hell. Jews should be forced to bake birthday cakes for Nazis. No. And well, you know, I've got something to tell him. That they, they were. That's already happened. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the Nazis did that in the concentration camps. They set up for Jews. Is that what he wants? Uh, that has happened. Well, um, I don't believe that Jews should be forced to make birthday cakes for anybody. Right. Uh, I don't think devout Catholics or Protestants should be forced to make birthday cakes for anybody. Uh, I believe in the freedom of association. I think if I walked into any business and the person said, uh, I'm not going to bake your, your wedding cake, your birthday cake, because I don't like Christian. That's his right. So what? There are plenty of other places. Right. Uh, anyway, that's the way I see it, but that's not the way that Gary Johnson sees it, and I would submit to you, you can't vote for him right. for those reasons yeah. and for some others. That just leaves me. I'm once again... <laughs> <laughs> Man standing once again. Uh, now, I'm not far from being done, folks, but uh, this is another Marco Rubio moment. Uh. <laughs> We're told quite often that we are, we are few and they are many. Number one, that's not true. That was proven today in Great Britain. There are so
so many more of us than there are of them. All we have to do is just unite and start doing something. Let me uh, digress for a minute and tell you that most of you probably think it's impossible for me to be elected president. Uh, it could happen if I had $10 million. If I had $10 million, I could help out of access in, in 49 states. It's too late for Texas. They've already closed. Uh, that's all it would take. Do you know if you get ballot access in all 50 states, you're entitled to civil service protection? That doesn't sound like anything. I mean, uh, or secret service protection, rather. No one's trying to kill me. I mean, I get a few nuts, usually from the Middle East, who tell me they know where my family lives and things like that. But uh, people that want to kill you don't post something on the internet or send you an email. They just kill you. Uh, but anyway, I'm not saying I need it. I'm saying that uh, it's pretty cool if you walk in a place like this and a bunch of guys in dark suits come in and search all of you and check around. I mean, you're somebody, in other words. All of a sudden, the media does cover you. Uh, that would be doable. But in order to do it, you have to have money or you have to have an organization in all 50 states. We don't have either one. I'm saying it's not as far out of reach. This thing. This was the greatest opportunity in the history of the Constitution Party. You know, uh, in, in 1860, uh, Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party destroyed the Whig Party in one election. And they did it because they had a dynamic candidate in Abraham Lincoln with a dynamic issue, that being slavery. I've got a large book at home about this thick of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. It's got the transcripts of all their debates. Unfortunately, there was no YouTube then. Uh, so you can't actually hear these people speak in debate. You can go on YouTube right now and hear all those great speeches that Winston Churchill gave. You know, I have nothing to offer you but blood, sweat, toil, and tears, that sort of thing, in his own voice. Uh, you can hear the speeches that, uh, that John Kennedy gave other great orators of our time, but you cannot hear the Lincoln Douglas debates, you can't read them. What I'm saying is, they destroyed this party that had held sway since the founding in one election. Um, we could have done the same thing with the right funding and the right organization. Um, let me uh, end by telling you that uh, this party is different. We're different from all the others. This candidate is different for reasons that I've set out for you. And uh, as I've told people across the country that I've been talking to, uh, I've told this story to, to the people in Salt Lake City that the many of them were there, uh, the jury was there, and many others. Uh, as I was giving the speech to the people about why you should select me, I think I had 15 minutes and I gave three of it or three or four of it to the person who introduced me, but I told a story about a woman I had come across uh, her speech she gave in uh, 1997, 1997 in, in uh, Arizona. She was a libertarian. She gave a speech at a libertarian convention back then. I read the speech and it said, she said to them, we live in a strange time. It's too late to save the system, but it's too early to shoot the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> so, I can ask you tonight, that was 19 years ago, I asked you tonight, uh, was she right? Is it too late to save the system? I submit that it is not. Many of us have the fetus attitude, it's, it's impossible, it can't be done. Uh, we should just retreat and save our money. I would submit to you that that is the wrong answer. It can be done. The fact that we're meeting here says that we're still free. Right. Uh, right. It also says that they don't care about us. But that's another story. Uh, uh, they don't care about us. They don't care. This group of people I was telling you about that run the world, they don't care who you vote for. They don't care who you elect. They don't care about you or your family. Uh, they don't care about the safety of the nation. They care only about their own needs and the needs of the people who actually run the world and 
intellectual elite that run it. That's another speech for another time. I think we're not dead yet. We're still free. That's my opinion. It can be done. I can't do it by myself. Uh, this is where I made you make a pitch to you to support me. Uh, I do need your, your time, your talent, your money. We desperately need your money. Uh, Joan and I would like to, to fly some different places, not just ride. We would like to be able to buy more of the stuff that you see here and to satisfy everybody that calls us. Nevertheless, it is what it is. I pray that you'll help me, folks. I pray that you'll pray for me. I really need your prayers. Joan and I do. It's lonely out there. Thankfully, I've got her. But I ask you to pray for me, to support me as you can as we go through this struggle. And uh, there's never been an opportunity like this. Just think about all those other candidates. You can't vote for them. Uh, I can say that same thing to groups all over the country. There are plenty of people who won't buy it, but if, if I could get in front of Christian groups, I can eliminate these other candidates. Now, I don't get in front of many of them. They won't listen to me, uh, but some of them have. I talked to two pastors last week in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, who said they would support me. Now, they were different kinds of pastors, but very fine people. That's all I have to say. Once again, I thank you, I appreciate you, I love you. I don't say that in a cavalier fashion, you're my people. I'm not ashamed of you, I never have been. And uh, as long as you have heard of the principles that I talked about tonight, I never will be. Thank you, folks. <laughs>